as a former politician. Okay. We might just wait a few more minutes to see um, if there are others who want who are logging in. All right. Well, let me know when I, you want me to share the screen. Yes, I'll let you know. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to say, as a former politician, if the media got something sixty or seventy percent right, you were kind of happy. It was, you know, <laughs> it was always. It was never a hundred percent, you know. No, no, no. Even if you gave them a press release and that, they still muck it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you Welcome, feeling? Graham and Ren. Ron, hi, hey, Graham. Hi. G'day, g'day, Michael. Good g'day, Ray. Oh. And everyone. <laughs> We've got our jumpers on. I haven't, but it's cold and good. I'm sitting here behind double glazing. <laughs> <laughs> and with a heater, heater running. I think it was minus four this morning or something oh. at the airport. Everywhere. And what, July is the coldest month of the year, isn't it? No, May. <laughs> May so far. So far. <laughs> okay, look, I think we might make a start. Um, it's just after two. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe others will join in as we go. So um, uh, I'm Ray Edmondson, President of the Friends of the NFSA, and I would like to welcome Michael, Michael Organ. Um, just to introduce Michael, um, he's an archivist, um, uh, former uh, archivist of the University of Wollongong, um, and uh, a former politician. Uh, he was the Greens member uh, for Cunningham for, for three years back in the... Um, Back in the in the two thousands, um, he's been a long time supporter of the NFSA. Uh, his blog on the NFSA and many other things is well worth a look at. And we gave a link in the uh, latest French newsletter, and I commend that to you. Um, so Michael is an expert on Metropolis. Uh, it's a passion of his, and um, I'll ask him to proceed with his presentation. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Ray. Okay, is that is the screen up, everyone? Oh, if you press on um, uh, start presentation. That's yeah. right. Yep, good. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Ray, and thank you, the friends, for inviting me to speak on one of my favourite films, which is the uh, Metropolis, the 1927 German film. I hope um, everyone's had a look at it at some stage, because we're approaching uh, about, in, in 2025, will be 100 years since the in production initially started. So what I'd like to do over the next 30 or 40 minutes is basically talk about the story of Metropolis, not the actual narrative, but about its creation, about its fate. Um, and like so many other silent, films from the silent era, it's had a rather tragic life, you could say. Um, I'd also like to talk about its relationship, the, the connections with Australia, which are also quite interesting. Um, you might say, ask why Metropolis? Well, I mean, Metropolis is an amazing film. It's, it's a classic. Um, it's, 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 it's seen as a very much a classic, but it's interesting that when Fritz Lang, the director, was asked this question in 1950, he said, why are you interested in a picture that no longer exists? And hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll understand what he's talking about there, because like so many silent films, they were um, subject to a a rather harsh life shortly after, from the time they were presented. It's also 
Another part is that it's quite relevant to us here in Australia because as, as we speak, there's currently a $188 million production in, in Melbourne of a Metropolis TV show, eight episodes for Apple TV. Um, it's funded by uh, Universal, by Apple, by the Australian government and by the Victorian government. It's going to create some 2,300 jobs. So that's going to be very interesting. It will probably be a bit of an updated version, I think, which I'm a bit worried about, but anyway. And then I recently attended in um, the Hayes Theatre Company, Elizabeth Bay's premiere season of a new play by an Australian playwright of Metropolis, which is based on the original uh, book, novelisation book by Taya von Harbauer. Now, Taya von Harbauer and Fritz Lang were married. Um, she was a writer, a playwright, a novelist, and he was a filmmaker and a bit of an artist as well. Um, they, they had a vision. Obviously, Lang had made a few films prior to, prior to um, thinking about Metropolis and around about 1924, about 1923, 24, they, well, actually early, about 1922, I think they came up with the vision of, of creating a trilogy of films um, relating to Germany, its past, its present and its future. And he actually produced those films. The, the, the one relating to the past was the Nibelungen, the one relating to the present was Metropolis. So you might say it's futuristic, but once again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that aspect of it. And the future film was Frau, Frau Mund, which was Woman in the Moon, which was the film movie that created the basic 10987654321 countdown of a rocket ship. So that was an interesting element. So um, the first part of Lang's trilogy was The Nibelungen, released in 1924. There was a two part uh, epic, a similar, in similar vein to The Lord of the Rings, basically. And, it had a, a slaying of a dragon. It was it was the, the traditional Nibelungen saga, which is well known from the Wagner's Ring saga about Brunhilde and Siegfried and Siegfried slaying the dragon, for example. Um, as you can see, it was quite a long film, over four, four hours, maybe five hours long. And um, as soon as that he was finished, as soon as Lang and von Harbaugh were finished with that film, Lang visited New York in 1924, and there he was, he encountered skyscrapers, for example, for the first time, and he was very impressed by that. This is a photo he took at the time of the New York skyline. And obviously that had a big influence on, on the production of Metropolis. Because from 1924 through to the middle of 1925, Lang and von Harbaugh were working on developing a script, a scenario, which eventually, um, Von Harbaugh has eventually appeared in 19, the end of 1926 as a novel. It was serialised, but it was also as a novel. And it was very much a standalone. It, the, the basic um, narrative of the book was similar to the movie, but it was very much a romantic, Germanic uh, novel, which was, um, it's worth reading if, if you're a fan of the film or you like the film. Um, but, and so Lang, Ling then used what he'd come up with with his wife to develop the script. And Ling often bemoaned that he was very much a visual person. He wasn't necessarily that focused on narrative and plot. And that was one of the reasons I, I could suggest that Metropolis wasn't the success that everyone hoped it would be. Um, so production of Metropolis began in May 1925 through to November. Uh, 1926. So it's a long production. It was probably the greatest uh, German film of the silent era. Not the best. It was flawed. I mean, there was, but it was in in in, in that regards. It was, and it was quite a long production. It's obviously um, dealing with issues such as the art of the film, the the innovation. I mean, the incredible robot. You've got Rotwang there, the um, Rudolf Klein Roger. Uh, Bridget Helm, who was the robot, the evil Maria, um, also the, 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 the um, main protagonist of the film, Maria. The design of the robot by Walter Schutz-Mittendorf was 
which formed the basis for R2-D2 in, in Star Wars, for example. Um, there's so many elements of Metropolis that I could just talk about for hours, but I'll, 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 try, to, I'll try to keep it um, as tight as I can. The, in saying it was the greatest film, it was in regards to the um, scope of it. It was the budget, 5 million German Reichsmarks. There was 10,000, more than 10,000 extras used in the film, children, people, all sorts of people. Um, Two million feet of film was shot. And I remember when I read that, I thought, that's an amazing amount of film. And, um, but, but in, in one of the booklets released with the release of the movie, there was all this data about the, the logistics of the film. And uh, the shooting script, or there's a copy of an image of the shooting script that had been um, used by one of the people involved in the production, and that survived. The, it was a very innovative film. You've got to remember that all the effects were done in camera. Um, whether it was a robot transformation scene, the um, the crowd scenes, a scene such as this, a lot of montage, a lot of uh, which was very popular, very popular in German art at the time. I mean, Metropolis is very much a reflection, because of Lang and others, of the art movements in Germany at the time: the Bauhaus, German Expressionism, um, Dada. Even there's a lot of that reflected in Metropolis. A lot of innovative, creative, innovative camera work as well. And that was in large part due to Carl Freund, who was the chief cinematographer on Metropolis. Um, Freund is well known. He, he went to America. He was the cameraman on Dracula and actually uh, directed a lot of the scenes in Dracula. He was the director of The Mummy, which is, you know, a very famous film. He was involved in Key Largo. He got an Academy Award for The Good Earth. And he um, also worked on the I Love Lucy show and was innovative in, in creating lighting, a standard kind of lighting for um, soap operas. Um, well, during production, there, there was a lot of promotion, a lot of, a lot of discussion, both in the American and the European and English, et cetera, um, movie magazines about the production. And you had people such as Sergei Eisenstein, the great Russian filmmaker visiting the set. There's a picture there of... Carl Freund's the man in the white um, in the white um, overcoat uh, work coat there. Fritz Lang, uh, Eisenstein, um, Alfred Hitchcock spent some time on the set of Metropolis as well, and at one stage had planned to produce an, an English version of, of the film. There's, a, there's an article about that. Um, Freund used mobile cameras. He used a lot of moving cameras. He was very innovative. And I should point out that at any at, at any point in the in the um, in the production, there was two or three cameras running. Um, you can see Freund there cranking the film, and it's my view very much that um, the film was cranked at sixteen to eighteen frames a second. Uh, when I was working with Graham recently on um, a, a blog on for the term of his natural life, we kind of come to the conclusion from that film which was also made in 1926, 27, that it was, it was cranked at 24 frames a second, similar to the modern, um, modern speed of film. So this 16, 18 frames a second slow crank, which was the same for um, the Nibelungen, is going to come to play into the release of the film, and I'll talk about that later. Metropolis was basically was a bit of a mess, really. It had so many themes, so many elements, so many things that Lang, the, the visual filmmaker, was trying to put into it. There was romance, there was revolution, there was industrial issues, there was alchemy, rock wing, this, this kind of wizard. There was a class struggle was part of it. There was the technology, the robot, the, the android, the transformation there, which was a theme that... Um, was reused basically in Blade Runner, including some of the buildings were, were reproduced for Blade Runner that were originally in Metropolis. And religion, there's Catholic themes in there. The, the picture there of um, Frieda on the Pater Noster machine, almost like Christ on the crucifix, crying out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The, the Maria, Maria in the catacombs with her Christian iconography behind her. And Fred, Joe Friedison is the evil kind of, um, I don't know, of the owner, the, 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 the Henry Ford figure of the metropolis. All these really interesting themes that are part of 
present in the film. Uh, Metropolis premiered in Berlin on the 7th of January, 1927. Um, it was a, a, a massive premiere, I think, politicians and wealthy people and everyone who was anyone in Berlin at the time attended the film, attended the premiere. There's one of the original three sheet movie posters next to it. Uh, the, the reception was mixed. It was, it was neither a success or a failure. It was kind of middling. Everyone was impressed, got a lot of reviews. Everyone was impressed with the cinematography, the filming and that, but it fell down in regards to the narrative and other elements. I should say at the outset that even though it was cranked at, at 16, 18 frames a second, when it was presented, it was presented anywhere from 24 to 26 frames a second. And um, you can just imagine that, um, I'll talk a little bit about that, the effect that had on the film. Um, there was an original score by Gottfried Hupert, who'd also done the, the, the score for Nibelunga, and that was printed and published, and that would have been distributed around to all the cinemas in Germany so that in this, this silent film, which was never silent, could be um, the, the accompaniment could be, um, could be presented. Um, sometimes there's full orchestras. I know in the presentation when it was first released in Sydney, there was a full orchestra. There was actually sound effects, um, smoke. I think there was even um, explosions going off. So it was it was very much not a silent film. It was very accommodated that. Uh, you can see also there was a lot of lot of media associated with it. There was magazines, promotional material, reviews. There was um, oh, I went the wrong way. Postcards were a big Big thing at the time, a whole series of postcards that you could collect. And um, this, is, this, this is the cover of a Belgian magazine, for example. Now, in November, now let's, I'll just get around to the story of what happened to Metropolis, not, not the actual story of the film, but actually what happened to the movie once it was released. In November of 1926, Lang basically produced his director's cut. It was 13,701 feet, uh, ran for, say, 228 minutes at 16 frames a second. Uh, three prints were, were, were produced uh, from the camera negatives, from the 2 million feet of camera negative, as you can... And all, each one of those prints was slightly different, actually, and um, which, is, which is really an interesting aspect of, of the movie because... If you had those two or three cameras running, you might have had five different cut uh, takes of a, of a scene, and they'll say, "We'll take, we'll use that scene," but then they'd use various cuts. Um, there was a local, and from those three negatives in November, uh, three three negatives to produce one for the local market, that's Germany. One for the international market, such as later on Australia, New Zealand, and Europe, England, etc. One for America, for the US market. Now, the local and the foreign market negatives were used to produce, produce copies of the film in Germany. The American um, negative was sent over to Germany, the, sent over to America. The Americans, Paramount had, in the middle of 1926, had, had to come in and bail out you for bits because it was, Metropolis almost sent it bankrupt. So the um, Paramount, it was released under the logo Parufamet. And um, Paramount then had a say in what happened to the film. So a negative was sent over to the United States. They didn't like it. It was too long. It was, had, it was too Germanic, I think, too foreign. So, so they handed the film over to Jack, not Jackson, Channing Pollock. I nearly said Jackson Pollock. Channing Pollock, who was a playwright, and he was given $5,000 to basically rewrite the movie and produce a, a version of it. And he did that, and in March 1927, the Pollock version was released. It was about anywhere between 10,000 to 8,000 feet long. So basically, Pollock cut 42% of the film of the um, film out. Now, you imagine if um, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring movie, three and a half hours or so long, if 42% if of that was cut out. How, how do you think, what effect that would have on the film? So Pollock basically turned Metropolis into a, a love story, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy, boy finds girl, with an inclusion of the most dramatic visual elements of the film. He, he just um, 
And what was cut out with that 42% was, was some quite significant material relating to um, why Rock Wang created the robot, for example, and um, a lot of other interesting themes of the film. And that was the version that most people saw from the middle of 1927. I mean, I think even at the end of 1927, Lang said his film no longer existed. And that version was often run at 24 frames a second. So, so, so everyone had their 90 minute feature, which was run very fast. Um, Metropolis was then released between 1927 and 29, all around the world. Here's, here's some footage. Here's some images of. Um, it was a big film. It was. It was. A, it was kind of like the Star Wars of the day. Um, there's a scene from Munich, from one uh, theatre in Holland, um, one in England when it was released as well. Um, finally, by 1929, it was being released in in Japan, for example. And there's some artwork from the Japanese release. You might remember that there's a section in. Metropolis of Yoshiwara, which is basically the, the blue light district of Metropolis. And I've got a feeling that um, Lang actually had visited Japan. He was a big fan of Japanese art and wood, wood block prints, etc., just as Van Gogh had been. And you saw that in the earlier image of um, Lang and von Harbauer in their Berlin flat. So by 1929, the film had been released. It had a, a pretty significant impact um, around the world. I mean, the Russians didn't like it for some example. Some They thought it was too communistic or socialist, even though Eisenstein was releasing, was doing films such as Strike and Battleship Potemkin, which are very much similar themes of, of ordinary people revolting against, um, against oppression. So that was quite interesting. And I've got a friend in... Um, Israel, who, 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 his research over the last 20, 30 years has been gathering information on the worldwide release of Metropolis, which is an interesting story in and of itself. So after 29, 1929, the film basically just, just, just became part of film history. Um, I'm not sure what happened during, during the 30s. After World War II, there was a, there was a release of it in... Um, coming out of England, but also in Australia. And there was a trailer produced. I could try to play this. I'll just see how that goes. Can you see this video? The story of a lady city of the year 2000 or 3000, where men were far underground, slaves to monstrous machines. Where every scientific aid is used to serve but one master, efficiently, and fantastic robots obey spoken commands. Millions of slaves, body and soul, create monuments to man's achievement. Nothing else matters but the supremacy of man. A whirlwind follows the trail of man's inhumanity, and disaster comes to metropolis. Well, oh. so that's that's a very Cold War trailer. You can just sort of see from that very much 1950s. I'm not sure whether that was made in England or even made in Australia. Um, you can see it had sound effects attached as well. So that was 1950. During the 60s, the film was available on 16 millimeter on I think what is it, 8.5 millimeter, the camera clubs, etc. And from 1976, it became available on. Um, on video, and that really expanded the interest in um, Metropolis um, from that period, um, because 
but, but the big change came in 1984 with the 19, with the release of a version of Metropolis produced by Giorgio Moroder, who was a, a um, Italian musician who was well known for his work with um, Donna Summer and other, other people in the disco genre. The Metropolis was coloured. Um, it also had a pop music score um, with artists including Freddie Mercury from Queen, Pat Benatar, Bonnie Tyler, Adam Ant, et cetera, et cetera. So from the mid-1980s, um, the fandom around Metropolis really grew. And um, I think this was also a period in which the German film archivists and other film archivists around the world, and Ray would very much be aware of all this, began to, began to think about, okay, we really need to take care of our silent film heritage. And as, as you know, German had this incredible silent film heritage and um, it was time to actually start to reconstruct and re-release a lot of this material and start looking all around for material relating to these films. And you could see from that trailer that the version of Metropolis that would have been shown in 1950 in Australia would have been the quality of that trailer as well. It was it was not very good quality. It was very, very far removed from first generation. So, so from the, during the 1980s and through the 1990s, there was work going on in places such as Germany to by people such as Eno Patalis to really rediscover a lot of their film heritage, start looking around the world for copies of, the, of um, good, gener good copies of their film to see what, whether they could to assist in that reconstruction process. Meanwhile, people such as myself who were fans of the film also started to, um, to work on the film. In the end of the 90s, I, I created a Metropolis Arc Film Archive website and I just, started to research the film, go to ask about the National Film and Sound Archive material, get various videos. I, pu I put a lot of this on the internet. I started to get contact with people from around the world, including German film archivists who gave me material from Germany because they weren't, due to copyright issues, they weren't able to put a lot of material such as um, uh, stills, etc., of the film up, um, whereas off the record, they gave me copies of the film and were happy for me to put it up because, as I said, the fandom started to increase. This is this is before things like YouTube and, and Facebook and all that. And during that, so so I developed my own film archive. As, as Ray mentioned, I was an archivist, but I was also a, a fan and um, I was able to bring together... And I was also a, a researcher. So I was doing research in the metropolis and... I included a lot of the material from the National Film and Sound Archive because this is where the role of Australia does start to play a part in the reconstruction and rediscovery and re-release of Metropolis because the National Film and Sound Archive actually had a first generation print of Metropolis. Now, as I said, the Germans produced um, three negatives and for their international market, they would produce first generation prints off that negative. Now, the, the print that arrived in Australia, the print, there might've been more than one, was actually colored. It was colored and toned and tinted. The prints, the German prints were not. And um, I think it's quite surprising to the German arch film archivist and that, that there, there were colored, original first generation colored prints of, a, of Metropolis that, it, that had survived. Harry Davison was the, one of the prints. Um, an interesting aside is that in sometime during the 70s, I think maybe even the late 60s, um, Forrest Ackerman, a famous American uh, fan, a, 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 a um, fan of the Universal Monster movies. He, he had magazines. He was a fan of Metropolis. He actually had a copy of the Metropolis robot um, printed, uh, produced for his own collection. He visited Australia. He he uh, met up with Harry Davison. Harry Davison told him he had to sit down and have a look at his own Metropolis print. And when he did, he, he said to Davison, "Well, there's material in this print that's not in any other print I've ever seen of Metropolis." He wrote about that, and I'm sure 
that was one of the reasons that the German film artist eventually found out about the, um, the Harry Davison print when, when um, it was acquired, uh, I think during Ray's period with the National Library Film Archive, but he can mention that when I finish. And, um, and eventually they got a copy of that and I, I, I believe it might've been some of the material out of the Australian print, I'll call it the Australian print, uh, was used in, in, in the, Harry, in the um, Giorgio Morado version. Because the Giorgio Morado version 1984 was probably one of the first times that there was an attempt to restore in, in a small way Metropolis. It only ran for 84 minutes. Um, it had some stills in there. It, it tried to replicate in a small way what was known about the original director's cut. Um, but it, it, um, and it ran fast, but it didn't. And it was trying to address inclusion of that missing 42% of the film. Um, there's also in, in the local collection, the Towsy collection, a photograph collection of thousands of, of photographs relating to the German film industry in the 1920s, including 222 items relating to the production of Metropolis. And some of those images were actually of scenes that were filmed, but maybe not had not survived in, in, in or were not known or or parts of the film that didn't make the director's cut even. So they were quite significant material. And I mean, this is an example of one of them. You can see Lang standing there with two of his actors, Carl Freund at the camera as well. Um, so this, this was all, as I said, I was, I was collecting material then right up until 2002 when I got elected to parliament, I was in until 2004. And I think during that period, I, I was working with Ray to um, try and extricate the NFSA from the AFC, Australian Film Commission. And I think Ray mentioned to me at the time, he said, oh, by the way, there's a copy of Metropolis in New Zealand. So in, in 2005, after I left Parliament, I had to go on a conference to New Zealand and I went and visited the New Zealand Film Archive. And I had a look at their Metropolis print. I didn't actually run it, but I did look at the negative, at the film, et cetera, and the various bits and pieces they had. They had a leader, which had this wonderful um, Leave Cinema Art Films leader, which would have been part of the original um, print that, that circulated in 1928. Both cinema art films released Metropolis both in Australia and in New Zealand around about the same time. And I looked at this uh, first, and I looked at the at the um, New Zealand Film Archive copy, and say there was about eight eight reels of film. I think about five or six of them were actually on Agfa film, which was basically the German first first generation German um, print. And they were coloured, etc. But there's also two or three reels of film that were black and white and had a a, a rank organisation leader and it appears that at some stage during maybe during the initial release probably probably during the 1930s or later uh, the uh, the people in New Zealand had requested from UFA or um, for some replacement reels so that the actual New Zealand print has this mix of perhaps two-thirds of it is its first generation similar to the Harry Davison print and coloured and a couple of other reels of black and white film, which is probably second generation or later, but still pretty good, pretty good material. I wrote a, re a brief report which on this and sent it over to the New Zealand film archivist, uh, sorry, uh, the German film archivist, including Werner Sudendorf. And um, they, they then followed up with this and acquired some copies of the, of the New Zealand film archive material for inclusion in their project, in their ongoing project to reconstruct Metropolis. And this was about 2006, 2006 or so. But the big break came in 2008 when uh, in Argentina, in a small film archive in Argentina, a copy of the original director's cut of Metropolis was located. Now, when that copy was sent over to Werner and the other German film archivists, they sat down and they were amazed. They, they, were, they, could actually, they said, look, we're actually seeing 
the original director's cut with perhaps 20% of the film that we had never seen before because by 2008, they'd probably been able to bring together about 80% of the original director's cut. Now, this Argentine print was not a very good quality. Um, a German man had been in Germany, in Berlin, and when the film first released, he, he, he purchased a copy, took it over to Argentina, and it was basically presented and shown there right through to, the, to after World War II. Um, at some stage in the 1950s or 60s, a copy was made, a dry print copy, not a wet print copy, onto 16 mil. So you had all the scratches, you had uh, the top 10% of the of the um, of the image cut off, but what but it was but it was a complete copy of the well, basically a 90% copy of the film. There had been some censorship. There was a, a scene of a of a naked woman in a taxi. There was some drug taking debauchery scenes in Yoshiwaras. There, there were some religious elements. So about two percent of the film was actually um, did not survive. So as we speak, uh, the version of Metropolis that you'll see in the DVD or Blu-ray that you, or the streaming version that you happen to come across, is is that ninety-seven percent of the original director's cut version. It runs for one hundred and fifty minutes at twenty-four frames a second. It's got the original Gottfried Hooper um, score, and um, once again, when that was released. Uh, a friend of myself and a friend from Israel, we 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 created a 16 frames a second um, version of it and, and had put that up on YouTube because um, I've, I've had a various arguments over time with people about how fast do you run Metropolis, and I'll stick to my guns that it should be run at 16 to 18, and when you run it at 24 frames a second, you turn parts of it into a Keystone cop. Uh, a movie and you lose a lot of the gravitas of the film. I recently presented a version of Metrop the Moroda version of Metropolis to a group of people in Melbourne and there's a lot of laughing during the, the actual film. Now there's no laughs in Metropolis. There's no, there's no jokes. It wasn't meant to be a comedy. But when you look at a, a 1927 silent film, some of the acting's a bit strange, the white face, um, acting by people such as um, Bridget Helm and Rock Wang and, and, and that is, it's, you know, very good acting, but some of it, you know, is, is quite amusing. Not that I've ever laughed, but when you run that film from 16 up to 24, when Frida and others, they're, they're running or they're, they're fighting on, on the top of, of a cathedral, it does become comic. And as I say, it lo loses a lot of gra that gravitas. And I know that from the comments I've received from the YouTube page where we've got the, six, the, the um, 16 to 18 frame per second version running, people are uh, really appreciating it and saying it's, it, even though it has no soundtrack, uh, appreciate the fact of, of watching this film running at the kind of pace in which it was cranked, hand cranked and produced by Lang and Freud. Um, so that, that's, that's basically the story of the film. The film is very influential. Um, it's, it's, it's well known as a classic and one of the greatest films ever made. It's not one of the best films ever made, but it is seen as, as a very much a landmark. Um, it's very influential, especially in regards to the artwork. Now, for example, I'll just show you a few of the posters that were released at the time. This is the original German three-sheet lithograph poster by Heinz Schultz Nudemann. And this is this is a classic piece of Art Deco work. Um, very rare now, um, I'll, I'll talk about that. Here's another one from Boris Belinsky, who was a, um, a French artist, and this was produced for the original French release of the film. And here's another Boris Belinsky um, poster. Um, in, in 2016, these two Australian posters were discovered um, now, does anyone, they were just um, inserts, 15 by 40 inch lithographs by Bernie Bray, uh, produced for the cinema art films. And um, you can see the one there on the right with the robot and the one on the left with the um, flood scene. Does anyone have an idea of the, this film, these posters were found in 2016, in 2017 they were 
offered for sale on a um, American auction house. Does anyone know what value? Give me an idea on what they think the value of them is, of, of especially the one on the right, what it sold for. Come on, a few guesses. People will have to unmute. Has anyone got a want to offer a guess as to how much they think this poster would be worth? Oh, a couple of thousand of Australian dollars. Anyone else? Um, oh, in excess of 10,000. <laughs> All right. $324,000. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that, that poster sold for $324,000. Uh, US. The reason it sold was because the most valuable posters in poster collection collecting is um, is these three. Number one is Metropolis, which in two thousand and five is valued at a million dollars. Now I think Leonardo DiCaprio actually has a copy. There's very few copies around. The Mummy was the next most value one, six hundred and fifty six thousand. Once again, that was um, directed by Carl Freund. And the King Kong three sheet, 585,000. So I think that, that's just an interesting aspect. That's why the Australian insert um, reached $325,000 American, uh, Australian. I think it was about $245,000 US at the time. Quite amazing. But it shows this, this presentation isn't, actually, isn't only about me as, a, as an archivist, but it's also about me as a fan. And there's a lot of um, the aspects of fandom that are really important, I think, in, 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 in this whole story about a metropolis and the preservation and the interest in it and all that sort of thing, which applies to Australia as well, that it's not just a case of um, film, arch film archivists, you know, you know, promoting material. It's about uh, connecting with community, connecting with fandom, connecting with people such as the Friends Group, et cetera. These films are, um, you know, it's not just the actual film, it's the artwork, it's the story of, of their life that's actually also very interesting. And you can go on YouTube and, and Facebook and all these social media places and, and find material relating to a film such as Metropolis. I'll just uh, close a few more minutes and I'll just talk briefly about the Australian release. Uh, Metropolis was released in Australia in 19, April of 1928 and also in New Zealand. In Sydney, it, I think there was two, two versions of Metropolis reached Australia. They were both based on the Channing Pollock cut. They weren't based on the um, Fritz Lang cut. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the Mel Melbourne got the 10,000 foot long version and Sydney might have got, which is... 10 reels, I think, when they often say how long is a film, I'll say it's 10 reels, which I'm assuming each reel was a thousand foot. And then um, Sydney might have got the um, 8,000, eight and a half thousand foot version. Because the Sydney version was a 90 minute, it was a, at the Regent Theatre, it was a 90 minute double bill with um, Charlie Chaplin's The Circus. And in Melbourne, it was, I think, about a two hour presentation, a bit longer, just a, a single. Now, the press sheet I'm assuming for its release in Australia would have included some of these graphic artworks by local black and white artist Percy Bannison. Very comic. Uh, this one, some of these images are from the Sun newspaper in Sydney. This is, um, that's why you can see at the top there, Charlie Chaplin in the circus. I cut the top bit off, but um, you can see that. Here's another one by um, Bannison. Here's another one, another couple, which are basically images from the film, plus that the um, you've got the picture of Charlie Chaplin there and an image from the front cover of the English novelization. But I'll, there's two other very interesting ones. This, remember, this is from April, May of um, 1928. And people have often said, oh yeah, Metropolis, it's, it's you know something to do with Hitler and all this sort of stuff. And I, and Lang and others said it's nothing to do with Adolf Hitler. Forget about that. But this, this image, which is from a Sydney newspaper in April, May of 1928, has the, has the um, 
with chocolate robot doing the um the Nazi salute. It's quite interesting that the artist it's gone their name SS, which has got which is just I don't know what that's about, but that's quite an interesting movie. And and moving at the time in May of 1928, of course, Adolf Hitler got 14 seats in the Reichstag, Reichstag and by by in, in, by the next year, they had 107 seats, so Hitler was very much on the rise. And unfortunately, once Hitler came along, the German filmmaking just fell apart. Uh, he, he really um, ruined the party, and a lot of the um, filmmakers ended up in America, including Lang. Uh, the other, there's another image which I find quite amazing. This was published in May of 1928, and... This image is more like something out of 1970s anime uh, from Japan rather than a 1928 um, Sydney newspaper um, because this, <laughs> it, the, the, the chocolate robot never does this. But it just shows how artists are reacting to Metropolis. And this continues to the very present day. This is a modern poster. So since since the 70s and 80s, Metropolis has been re-released around the world in various forms. And often when it's re-released in theatres and shown and special presentations, there'll be special posters produced. And especially in places like America, artists are constantly reacting and producing all sorts of Metropolis posters. And this, this is just one. Um, there used to be a lot of normal hand done, but a lot of them are graphically now with paint photoshop and all this sort of thing so it's 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 quite interesting and actually on places such as youtube now you've got versions of metropolis that have been colorized that have actually have um soundtracks in, inserted including um including people speaking so i can just imagine that in the future we're going to have 3d versions of metropolis so just in closing um you know, I'm a big fan of Metropolis. Metropolis is, is a very messy film. It's it's an amazing film. I think this this collage by uh, Boris Polinsky from 1927 really sums the film up. You've got you've got the um, the vampish evil Maria. You've got the the um, crazy mad scientist Rotwang there on the right, which was replicated by Peter Sellers in um, Doctor Strangelove. If you can remember that scene where he's He's, he's that mad scientist with the um, with the um, plastic rubber hand. You've got the robot. You've got the the the, um, the skeleton, the death. You've got the transformation uh, process. You've got the machines, the industry, the, the the alchemy, all those sorts of elements. The the pentagram, etc. So as I said, it's an amazing film. Lots of Lots of themes, lots of things to to dig deep into, and um, that's all I've got to say. If anyone's got any questions, thank you, uh, Michael. It's um, it's Graham here. I've got a, I've got a question. You were you talked about the um, the trilogy in the late nineteen twenties, and you referred to Metropolis very much as being a film of the present. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. Um, when I say that, I think I'll, these images reflect that. Uh, it, is, it is presented as futuristic and, and all the publicity will say things like it's, it's future and 100 years in the future. But what you've got there is you've got um, Henry Ford and, and industri industrialization and scientific management was very much of what was happening in Weimar, Germany at the time. There was a whole lot of industrialization going. So uh, Joe Friedison is basically Henry Ford, and Henry Ford was a big fan of Adolf Hitler as well. So you've got this whole aspect of um, mechanisation, which was happening in Germany. So that's a reflection of present-day Germany, Weimar Germany. You've got um, you've got other aspects such as the um, the, the political turmoil. You've got the, the religion and and the, the people are. People were very traumatized. The Germans were, were completely traumatized by World War One. You know, hundreds of thousands of people killed and, and um, you know maimed, and so all these. That's why uh, Weimar Germany was such a political and social mess. It was um, 
it's still a, a democracy, but there was a lot of, there was, you know, there was a famous poster saying death, death walks the streets or something. And, and Lang had seen that poster and used that to include in his film that scene in the cathedral of the seven, uh, you know, the seven deadly sins. So he, he you and, and Lang and Germans and von Harbour, they were Catholic. So you have this, how do we reflect some of the social turmoil in Germany at the time? The, um, the, the, the and, and also the, um, there was just the, the, mor the morals, the, the, the sex and the drugs. It was just a, a wild scene, like in Cabaret, you saw in the film Cabaret. There was all sorts of debauchery going on. There was so in in Metropolis, you reflect. There's all that reflection of present day Weimar Germany. It's not a picture of the present of the future. It's very much a reflect of Lang reflecting what was going on all around him. You know, um, whether it's Maria's dance, whether it's the it's the um, it's Frieda Frieda in his room reading the Book of Revelation, Maria. Um, the, almost like the Virgin Mary pre preaching to the workers about salvation and that a saviour will come to save you. That's what I was talking about, how Metropolis is very much, even though it's, 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 it's presented as this futuristic thing, it's not actually futuristic. It's really, obviously, the robot thing is futuristic, the, 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 the android thing, but, but that was... That was very much part of the talk of, oh, mechanisation, we're going to lose all our jobs, we're going to be replaced by machines. When it was released in Japan in 1929, they were very much into robots as well. They just loved Metropolis because it, and, and even now, as I said, I mentioned Blade Runner and the androids and all that sort of thing. There's, and that's, that's relevant to today, actually, as, as our concerns over being replaced by, we've got the screenwriters, who, who are on strike in America because they're going to be replaced by AI. We've got, and so this, this is why I can, I, I'm saying that Metropolis might have been presented as futuristic, but that actually it was a reflection of the present day turmoil. Yeah. And th thank you. And I, I should have mentioned at the beginning that it's a really excellent presentation, Michael. Um, yeah. Thank you, Graham. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, that really was superb. And I'm, and I'm Especially at the end, the, the posters and so on, which have well, most of which are quite new to me. Um, there's a whole story there. It's quite stunning the the, the uh, succession of images and what one might read into them. You know, um, so yeah. So are there other um, comments or questions? Uh, Ma Michael, uh, Paul, Michelle, yeah. um, a, couple, a couple of points about Metropolis. You've made a, a two or three comments saying you're less than happy with the completed film, so I'd like your thoughts on on expansion of that. Secondly, I'm not sure if, you, if you've explored, but the connection between Metropolis and the actual um, thinking that was going on in Weimar, Germany, and particularly, say, Frankfurt School, what have you, in Germany, about the concept of the city. And this is, I found very difficult to find um, material on this of the linkage between the film and uh, modern thinking of the city because there's no question that there is a, a there is a connection I just haven't found anything reasonably discussing this because we know that in the 20s particularly uh, early part in Germany was the first discussions of the concept of the city the modern city and I'm sure that these um, discussions, particularly around 1907 forward, probably led to the writing of the book and then the film. Then that, in turn, affected America, and you had what's called the Chicago School of Architecture Sociology talking about the metropolis. And it, it yet I found um, brief references saying it affected clearly the film affected the thinking on the development of the city, which is of the, the cities we live in. Just your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, great question. So the, the way that, what, what I'm not happy with is, is, is the, basically the version of Metropolis that most people see, which is run fast, um, and I, I feel the losers all this gravitas. When I sit down and, you know, quietly sit there for three hours and 42 minutes, 
and just watch Metropolis run at 16, 18 frames a second. I am quite happy because that's like watching, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings or something. You're getting all that texture, all that subtlety. For example, there's one there's one scene in Metropolis where, which is a good example of, of, of this, uh, where uh, Frida has just seen uh, the machine explode. He's seen all these men um, blown up and, and killed and et cetera. And he's just traumatised by what he's seen, by the working conditions. He confronts his father in this massive Art Deco, huge office, and he's talking, he's pleading to his father. Now, in, in the version most people see, especially the, the Pollock version, that was just cut from about five, six minutes down to about two minutes, and it was run fast. In the original version, you see him pleading, and you actually see when you see his father, when he, his, when he says to his father, what about these poor people? What about your workers? And run slow, you see that Jay Friedison just shrugs his shoulders mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very powerful that way. And so it's, an, it's amazing how that, that gravitas is disappeared when, you, in, when, you've got, when you've got it running fast, et cetera. So that's what I'm not happy about. I think um, the, it, it is a very German film. It's not an American film. It's not a um, Hollywood movie. So if you we a lot of people have never don't know about foreign films. I really didn't know about foreign films before I came across Metropolis. And since then, I've watched a lot of Italian films, but that's about it. Um, so I think people are so used to um, American films. I think you know they can look at Metropolis, and as I said, that those people who watched it they laugh. But I, I think it's a it's a great achievement. I suppose they could have could have done better. But Lang was a, a visual filmmaker and. That's what he's left us with, and I think um, that's why it's great. In regards to the city, um, I, I was just looking earlier this morning, and it said on a German thing, and it was Metropolis, Metropolis. And you won't you won't necessarily find anything of any intellectual discussion, but in the art you will, because there are some famous collages called Metropolis produced in Germany in 1924-25, which just the these massive, massive collage with buildings, just all these buildings mm -hmm. piled up, piled up by, and that, that influenced, um, and that probably grew out of what was going on with Bauhaus, obviously. And also the Italian futurists, of course. Yeah, all of that. So I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not, you probably know a lot more, but I'm Bauhaus. Yeah. I mean, Lang's, Lang, some of some of the actual set designs in in um, Metropolis is a Bauhaus film. There's lots of elements of Bauhaus in the film. You know some of the designs, etc. I think Lang's house in 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 Berlin that he had built was Bauhaus. So <laughs> you know it was all. So he, he he was an artist. He took on board all. He, you know he's he just he, a, he took on board a lot of this and the um the, the massive collage. Collage series that was called Metropolis. It was called Metropolis, and um, I think Lang took on board that kind of thing. And then he then he visited to New York, and he saw the skyscrapers. So you're right. You might necessarily find a lot of that kind of American uh, post movie discussion, but there was a lot of other discussion going on around around that sort of thing. And maybe um maybe when you find out the answer to your question, let me know because I'd really like to. <laughs> Well, I'm still trying to find. I'm sure Walter Benjamin wrote something, and I, I, I mean, it must be lost because I haven't yeah, found it yet. I, if I find anything, I'll pass it on to Ray. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is stuff. I'm sure there's stuff because there was a lot of intellectual discussion at the time in that period going on, well into the 1932. But for example, going back to that German um, film movement, for example, Camdenschaft, which is yes. say within a few years of this film. It's a similar film um, with a similar slow motives. You know, it is not dissimilar. You're quite right. It's, it's a very Germanic film. I think yeah. that's. I think one has to approach it from that point of view. Yeah. Other, Thank other you. Other questions. Yeah, yeah. Other comments. Well, can um, I just can I just add, add Graham here? Yeah, just quickly add, yeah. add two other comments. Um, Franz Kafka, of course, wrote America in in the 1920s, and that's very much a reflection of his own. 
um, view of the city as personified by New York and a trip that he influenced by a trip that he he'd made to New York, I believe, at that time. Um, the other thing is that um, other German silent films had been released in Australia, particularly um, Fritz Lang's originally two-part Dr. Mabusa yes. silent film about 1924 25. That was released in Australia. I don't know how well it did. Um, and I, d I don't know whether it was it was the two part version or or a cut down version that was uh, released in Australia. Um, just yeah, I, I thought I'd throw those two points in. So. Other comments, uh, Peter. I think uh, had... Yeah, oops. thanks, um, thanks. Thanks for that, Michael. That's, uh, that was a, a great presentation. number of things I, I just wanted to add um, to yours, because I was part of a panel discussion about Metropolis when I was at the Munich Film Festival um, some years ago. Wow. Um, and, uh, and I tend to agree that it is, I think, the finest film ever made, hence uh, my radio shows are called uh, Movie Metropolis, but that's, that, that's as an aside. Um, and because the film interweaves so many themes, I think, successfully, now that we're able to see the almost fully restored version uh, of the film, that uh, it was groundbreaking in many respects. And yes, it is sort of a science fiction film, because it is set in 2026, but it also reflects the Weimar Republic and the politics of the day. It's interesting, the, the issues about social justice that the film explores. And uh, what was uh, so fascinating about that is that uh, von uh, Habu uh, and Lang, who were married at the time, uh, fought uh, a fair bit about the way the film should conclude and whether, and, and the Americans picked up on this, uh, it concluded with the uh, industrialists winning uh, and, and it was the evil unionists and, uh, and the people who were blocking progress who were stopping um, uh, things from happening uh, in Germany. Um, but uh, in fact, the film is very much a Marxist social justice type of film. And surprisingly enough, Hitler and Goebbels loved the film because they saw it as a model for their future national socialist state in terms of uh, everyone being supposedly equal and of sharing the wealth and all of that sort of thing. Of course, they decided to take that in a somewhat different direction, but we won't go there. Lang, Lang was offered uh, the opportunity, even though he was Jewish, to be an honorary Aryan which I found quite amusing. And, and there was a comment that uh, it was either Hitler or Goebbels who said, we decide who's not Jewish. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Got so, out of town shortly thereafter. He just, he just <laughs> ran away. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but of course, Lang could see the writing on the wall and immediately packed off to, uh, to America. Um, the, uh, one of the other aspects you mentioned was the huge amount of footage that was shot during uh, the making of the film. One of the main reasons for that is because it was all done in camera, they had to constantly rewind the film um, to get the, uh, the supposed special effects, the in-camera special effects on there, such as the Brigitte Helm robot and all that sort of thing, the, uh, the, the circles, etc. Yeah. And because of that, there were lots of errors that were made, there were uh, uh, lots of problems with the, with the film, and so they had to constantly keep reshooting. Um, so that explains part of that. It's amazing when you read stories about how the extras on the set suffered considerably uh, during the making of the film. Including children. Uh, including children, exactly. And because the economic circumstances at the time were so poor, uh, children and others flocked to be extras in the film to get a, a ration or something to to tie them over but yes they were treated abysmally and even more so Brigitte Helm was uh, treated abysmally in her costume and in uh, uh, stunts and other things that she had to um, compose <laughs> uh, or, or, or uh, be part of without any stand-ins or anything like that so she had a, a, a dreadful time <laughs> during the making of the film I've, I've read so much about her uh, her situation it's a uh, uh, it is quite an, an amazing, incredible film, which I think is a landmark film um, and deserves to be uh, in the pantheons of one of the best films ever made. Can I just make a quick comment there? Um, yeah, Hitler was a fan. He was especially a fan of the Nibelungen, as you would suspect. Um, and um, the social justice issue, the end of the film is really, 
the basic theme of the film was that head and it, in order to conciliate between the head and the hand, which is basically the um the, the rich and the poor, the machines and the worker and, and the boss, you, you need the heart. And basically it's about compassion, having compassion in life to okay, if you're a boss, you've got to have compassion for workers and all that sort of thing. So that was uh, that was the, the main theme. And that's what, as you said, that Lang and von Harbauer were arguing about that because, I mean, he still kept it in. The way it was presented was a bit, it didn't work that well, um, but um, it, it was there. And finally, just um, in regards to, I, I didn't mention that a big factor in the restoration of the film was the coming down of the Berlin Wall. Because when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, the West German film archivists got access to the East German film archives. And in the East German film archives was a camera negative copy of Metropolis. It was only about 50 or 60%, but it was a camera negative. And um, this is the reason why the version we now see on DVD and Blu-ray and that is, is quite spectacular, it, even though it does also include that very rough Argentine. So it, it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous, from the, you know, original camera negative print through to a sixth or seventh generation 16-millimetre copy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and we should also mention von Harbu was a Nazi symp sympathizer, and uh, and uh, that's another reason that uh, Lang fled well, <laughs> Germany. I think there was a lot of Nazi sympathizers in Germany during the during during that old period. <laughs> that's another story. That's I think true. The lady had a question, right? Yeah, uh, I just yeah. wanted to say, Ufa, yeah. of course, now is Studio Babelsberg. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Babelsberg Studio in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, Liz, I think you had a question. Uh, yes, I did. Um, uh, Michael, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I heard, uh, did you um, say any, uh, expand on the Tausi collection? Uh, I, I think you, um, I missed it. Uh, I think you um, expanded on the Harry Davidson collection, but I I missed what you said. Oh, will would you say explain uh, about the Towsy collection? Okay, the Towsy collection. I'm not a real expert on that, but basically what I know about it is it's in the National Film and Sound Archive. It was this incredible collection of. Um, Photographs, stills, production stills, etc., relating to the German film industry in the 1920s. And as I said, it included 222 items directly related to Metropolis. So um, I look forward to the day when they're all available online on the NFSA on, on its website. I, I just produced, I just included one, one, one copy. But those those film stills, once again, in restoring and and re-presenting some of these films that have been cut to pieces that have been lost that no longer exist, like, for example, Ned Kelly. Some of these, some of these stills and, and um, you know, shots that are very, very important in, in the reconstruction process. And it's quite an amazing collection to have here in Australia. I, I don't know the full story of Towsig. Um, I, I should, but I maybe that's something I can do a bit more research on. But it's maybe I could, I could come in yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> Oh. Yep, the <clears throat> Tausig collection was uh, put together by a guy called um, Hans Tausig, and uh, he worked in the Austrian film industry and perhaps more widely in the 20s and 30s. And he pu just pulled together this huge collection. And after the war, he emigrated to Australia and he brought the collection with him. And at some time, I think in the 1950s, he donated the collection to the National Library. Um, and hence it was the form of the beginning of what became the NFSA stills collection. It's about um, 25,000 st uh, stills in all, um, includes some astonishing material, including um, a hand handwritten document by Louis Lumiere. And um, uh, when I, uh, I had some contact with the, um, the Deutsche Film Museum that did one of the restorations, 
it's pointed out to me that uh, a lot of the Chelsea collection is actually unique, certainly from the metropolis. Um, many of those stools uh, were unique to the Tiasi collection. So, um, and if you go through it, the quality of the stills, as was the case with um, stills photography in the 20s and 30s, they're often done on glass plates. And so the quality is beautiful. And uh, as Michael mentioned, okay, there are 222 stills from Metropolis. There are many other German films. And um, later in the year, um, we will have a webinar um, from Monica Connors, who is a former NFSA staff member. She's now in Adelaide, um, but she's done um, uh, research work on the Tausi collection and particular stills in it. And uh, she'll she'll um, give us a webinar on, on that work. Uh, she did, did this for an MA project. Uh, secondly, I might say something about the, um, the Harry Davidson uh, print. Harry Davidson was a Melbourne film collector. Um, when he died in um, uh, uh, sometime in the 70s, I can't remember the exact date, uh, his widow um, sold his collection to the National Library and included his print of Metropolis and a lot of other material as well. That was an astonishing collection. Um, and thirdly, the, the Michael's comment about um, the East German Film Archive um, <clears throat> and um, the fact that they had a, a camera negative of Metropolis. Uh, what I find rather fascinating is a question we can't answer now, is that after the war, um, when, of course, the Russians controlled um, what became East Germany, uh, I know from a talk given by the, the former director of the, um, the Staatliches Film Archive, the East German Archive, but the Russians um, basically pillaged the uh, German film history and they took everything they wanted back to Moscow. And they left what they didn't want back behind in, in Berlin. The East German Film Archive is found on what the Russians left behind. Wow. What do they have in Berlin? What a metropolis do they have in Berlin? In, in sorry, in, in Moscow. Uh, the the um, Russian Film Archive, was Film of Fond, is an absolutely vast installation. And um, uh, who knows what's there? Uh, there could be much more material in Metropolis, but right now, I don't think they're likely to tell us much about it. Um, Can I make a comment, please? First, first of all, thank you very much, Michael, indeed, for an amazing presentation. Mm -hmm. The film itself is amazing, too. It's many years since I've seen it. But right from the word go, the thing that was constantly in my mind wasn't so much was about um, the present and the Weimar, Weimar Republic, but was about the future and about fascism. It was in my mind from the very first um, sequence, you know, with the cowed workers, uh, reminded me reminded me very much of, you know, the slave labour uh, factories and so on in uh, in the World War Two. And uh, there were many other features. The oh, the Moloch too reminded me Moloch. That reminded me of the uh, gas chambers. So you know, I'm not surprised that. Uh, um, it seems terrible to say it, but it almost seems as though Hitler might have got some ideas from the from the film. Now that's that's a really iconoclastic thing to say, but I mean, I still think it was a. I mean, it, the ending was kind of weak. I thought, you know, the although it's it's good that it has a compassionate ending, but um, I suppose, but um, but ex extraordinary uh, extraordinary film to see. But for me, it didn't make me think of Weimar. It just made me think of fascism. Can I just respond to that? I've worked in factories, I've worked in steelworks, I've worked, and I, I see a lot of when you know I grew up in Wollongong, which was very much an industrial town, and I, when I looked at Metropolis, I could see very much of what I experienced at work. That you, you, you know you're working in incredible conditions, dusty, toxic environments, all that sort of thing. It's not, and we're not. This is Australia. It's not fascism. It's about. It's about how people treat workers and and that that is an ongoing an ongoing issue around the world now obviously the way you you saw it was you know really really relevant and to you and someone to me when I look at metropolis I see that workers workers being um, mistreated and, and abused but I see it from that from that from that sort of um, perspective of social justice as well so yeah I think, and I could say that anyone who watches Metropolis, there's there's so much in there. You, there's you can probably find something you, that you can really relate to, whether it's those um, the revolution, that the, the way that workers are treated, the, the machines, the actual um, the role of Maria, 
the role of Joe Friedis and the, the, the and the just, just the son who's just this wanton um, son who has no, you know, he's just he's just running around with prostitutes. He's just taking drugs. He's you know he's he's got no life, and he he, he thinks, well, what's life all about? As you say, it wasn't really um, the ending. What was a bit lame, but the themes are all there throughout the movie. Uh, Thank you, Michael. Michael, there's a comment from um, Safka. Uh, what memorabilia do you have in Metropolis and what's your favourite piece? Oh, well, for example, I've got, I don't know if you can, oh yeah. So this is, this is the Metropolis paperback, okay? Now, when I say a paperback, people go, well, what paperback do I mean? You, you know, it wasn't, oh, hang on, where is it? Hang on, where is it? There we go. So this is this is the copy of, from 1927 of a paperback copy of the Von Harbaugh book, which includes on the cover a, a lithographed um, copy of the larger three sheet poster. So that's that. There was a lot of a, Metropolis was released with magazines, all sorts of things like that. Um, it was released in a. a um, I mean, here's a copy of the original book with gold binding and all this sort of thing. So there was a lot of, as I said, you could have postcards. I've got the, uh, the magazine that you can see there with the um, Boris Belinsky, um, with the Boris Belinsky um, cover on it. I've also got a few, I've got a lot of posters, not original posters worth $300,000, I'm sorry. But I've, I've got a lot of posters from um, recent the recent releases, but what I do have is in the, in America there's a firm called S two that uses original early nineteen hundred lithograph machines, big machines, and, and has reproduced original lithograph copies of posters. And I've got a copy of the the Chopper's three sheet and a copy of the um, King Kong three sheet, and they've been reproduced identically according to the original lithographic techniques. So um, quite amazing stuff, but they're, they're my favorite little knickknacks. And I, I haven't got a lot of money. I just picked up things off eBay here and there. And I remember picking up for $24 an original um, Belgian magazine of Metropolis, which was um, probably worth a couple of thousand dollars. Um, so, yeah, just just um, I'm quite happy with a few things I've got, but that's yeah. Being a historian, being a, like, like whether it's Forrest Ackerman with who who did major things as a fan, or whether it's people such as myself, who, there's people all around the world who just um, love the movie. You know, I wonder if anyone else here has got any Metropolis knickknacks. Have you got any, Peter? <laughs> Actually, no. Uh, the best I did was uh, taking a photo at Studio Babelsberg um, by the uh, the head of the studio where I was standing next to the Brigitte Helm uh, statue. <laughs> oh, yes. I've got a lot of Brigitte Helm stuff as well. She was quite an amazing actress. Uh, yeah. Ren, I think, I think you had a, qu a question on the chat. If you'd like to ask it. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Ray. I'm not sure if I'm appearing on the screen, am I? Yes, I don't know. Yes. Oh, I am. Oh, good. Um, thank you, Michael. No, it was just um, watching the film and uh, and hearing the um, the, the discussion. Uh, I was reminded of Tagore's 1925 play, uh, Red Oleanders, which has got, I mean, it's not cinematic, but it just seemed to me that the date, mid-1920s, um, issues such as mechanization, I guess Henry Ford, uh, the subjection of humanity. Um, I just wondered if if anyone's ever um, among the influences that, that Lang and von Harbour um, were subject to, I wondered if that, uh, um, if any credit's given to Tagore or Tagore himself was, uh, was drawing inspiration from what was what, happening in Berlin. What was the name of the play? It's called Red Oleanders. No, I've I've never heard of it. Um, okay. R U R I've heard of. You know the 
Rostin's robots, the first term, use of the term robot. But having said that, I'm sure, I'm very sure that Lang and that would have taken that on board. Was that was that German? Uh, no, it's Indian. Indian? Yes. Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore. Well, maybe they maybe yeah, you know, I haven't I haven't come across it. There's there's quite a lot of there's books and all published in Metropolis and aspects of it and influences and etc. So if it was 1924, maybe it was came to their attention too late in the day. Um, I, I I don't know, but but once again, it's a zeitgeist thing, isn't it? It's yes. what's in the zeitgeist, and you know. Yeah. Um, that that was that that was the sort of cross current that was coming to me, but obviously not cinematic. But um, oh yeah, yes, Lang and von Halbert, Lang and, and that. As I said, I think Lang actually went to Asia at some stage. He was, you know, he was very literate, very, you know, and there was a lot. He was taking a lot of influences. He had, and he had this wonderful team of, on the production. The people from Russia, from all parts of Europe, were came and worked on the team, whether it was for, um, for costumes, whether it was for set design, whether it was things like posters and all that. Um, so there was a lot, there was a, a quite a rich production team involved in both Nibelunga and, and Metropolis and um, the cameraman and all that. So there was a lot of influences, a lot of, a lot going on in, in Berlin in that mid period. I mean, data was, was popping up and, you had Bauhaus, you had German Expressionism. Uh, it was just it was just a rich, a wonderful place to be. I think it would have been quite crazy to be there. <laughs> but um, yeah, there was a lot of lot of influences. And and even if it was in an Indian play, maybe it did get to Germany at some stage. But you're right. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks, Ray. Are there any other comments or questions? The uh, um yes. I have um I've got a um, a comment that it obviously was influential uh, in Hollywood uh, or all over. Uh, um, and it reminded me of modern times and um, Atlas Shrugged and uh, Brave New World and uh, N Plus One, uh, but. Um, the, the part of the uh, workers going down into the catacombs reminded me of the Nibelungen uh, going underworld. Uh, and um, uh, back to the influence, uh, the chase scene by uh, uh, involving Rotwang and um, Maria uh, obviously uh, was really influential to subsequent chase scenes. Well, even the robot creation, that was influential in Frankenstein movie, you know, things like that, the actual creating the lab, the lab, the laboratory. I think it, it's quite subtle what all these influences are, but, but when I said Eisenstein visited Alfred Hitchcock, I, I'm not sure whether Chaplin actually visited the set, but... Um, yeah, they, they were learning a lot of lessons, and the Americans yeah. not only learned a lot of lessons from um, from the German films, but a lot of those a lot of those people like Murnau, and they all ended up in um, they all ended up. Who was the one who did some like it hot? Um, they, all these Billy, Billy Wilder. Billy yeah. Wilder. All these Germans ended up in in Hollywood. I mean, Lang didn't do so well there, but he was still there, and. Um, you know, a lot of that film noir and all that. I mean, it's, you know, when you realise that Dracula, I mean, there's a there's a scene in Metropolis where Carl Freund's on the camera, on the world, world camera, and, and Fried is going to pick up a, a bit of cloth. He's trapped in this room downstairs and he, his hand moves and you see him, you see his hand moving down onto the ground. Mm. When well, you look in Dracula, those same kind of... Seen as in Dracula when you see it, they're in the catacombs and it's slowly moving, the camera's moving towards the coffin and all this sort of stuff. So um, a yeah. lot of that, a lot of that stuff was copied, but that's that it's the same as as, as um, George Lucas saying he copied Kurosawa for Star Wars mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. that. Very um, and interestingly that uh, 
when um, the profile shots, uh, I can't remember um, uh, what they were, but they were two profile shots and they reminded me of daguerreotypes. Uh, they were surrounded by um, uh, what looked like um, an oval shape. Oh, okay, yeah. And they just, reminded yeah. me of early uh, miniatures, actually. Yeah, I just want to follow up, up what just Liz said, because I've only picked that up on the restored print. I studied the film in the 70s. And in the restored print, especially in the catacomb sequence, you can see that when there's a mass scene, the, the, one of the, the main characters highlighted, there's a highlight light. And I've never noticed this in this film before. Oh, what the light is shining on. Through. Yes, and this gives you the halo effect yeah. of that character. And this is a very deliberate. Okay. I did not, I've never seen this before, but it's only in the restored print. Um, but it's really obvious in the restored print. And it happens in a number of times, for, and not only from a lighting point of view. It's really interesting that how it's done because it's, it's clearly had to be specially lit and to follow the character. And sometimes it's, the character's moving and the light moves with the character. It's really interesting. Well, that whole catacomb scene is quite amazing. The when yeah. Wang's pursuing Maria in the catacombs, because a lot of the a lot of the other filmmakers said, "How did Lang and Freud do that?" Because it was all black. It was black with just this spotlight. And this yeah. this sort of filmmaking was 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 incredibly innovative. You know, the the, the use of the light, and you with the final thing where all you see is from. Is this light comes? Is this face comes out of nowhere at rock wing and with this light behind him? So that whole catacomb scene, whether it's the halo effect or or the Maria chase effect, where all the all the rock wing's got is 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 a, is a, a light to shine on Maria. I mean, they're really significant pieces of um of camera work. In, in and also clearly beginning of film noir. We can see oh, the beginning of film noir. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you had that famous um, camera work in um, Nosferatu, you know, the, the use of shadows. Yes. You know, that, that's also part of it. And I think uh, some of those some of those cameramen actually worked with Freud on, on Metropolis and other things. So there were the, they were all working together. Hoffman, I think, might have been one of them who actually worked on worked on um, Nosferatu. So yeah, that, there, there was it was such a, a, a rich a rich environment, I think, for those filmmakers. Folks, we're getting towards the ninety minute mark, so we'll need to, to draw to a close. Um, are there any other questions that people have or comments? Uh, Ray, I just wanted to mention briefly to to, to Michael um, talking about Asian influences and talking about the Japanese influence in particular. Are you aware of a Fritz Lang film called ha Harry Curie, made in nineteen twenty one? A feature that he made. Yeah, that's why I suspect that he. I mean, as I said, he 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 was a big fan of um of Yukio Yukio um art. I mean, he's he's got his. You, you see this massive um wall hanging he's got, and then on the right he's got some um, Japanese woodblock woodcuts. So he was very he was very much into Japanism, mm. and um. And I, I haven't actually seen that movie. I, I know it, it survives and it didn't seem to be very good quality, but um, yeah, Harry Carey, Harry yeah. Carey. Yeah. It, it, it's actually available on, on DVD and along with other um, features, probably two or three other features that he that uh, Lang made very early in his career. Harry Carey's not not an altogether satisfying experience. It's... it's um, Stylized beyond belief, but it's um, it, it 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 has a certain hypnotic effect. So I, I do recommend it. Yeah. yeah, and it's strange that he should put Yoshiwara as the um, as the red light district in Metropolis. Yeah, yeah. which which kind of suggests to me I should try and chase it up that maybe Lang actually visited Yoshiwara in Tokyo. <laughs> maybe. Okay. I think we probably need to draw it to a close now. Um, thank you, Michael. It, it was a terrific presentation. And um, we could come discussing this, but uh, it leads in so many directions. Um, so the stature of the film is just is enormous. And it's there on the web to see now. Um, and we can review it. And this, this webinar will go on the, on the Friends website. 
and the films will continue to be, continue to be accessible um, on, online. So thank you all for joining in today. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll see you at the next the next webinar, which is in two weeks' time. Uh, Patrick um, McIntyre will be talking about his um, strategic vision for the NFSA, and we'll send out information about that on Monday. So thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thanks.